Well, there was one of these last year and the year before, so why not this year too? Hi, I'm Irene, and this is the annual Inkworks Favorite Art Things video, the 2022 edition. Everybody's doing it, and I want to horn in on the action, too. Of course, your time is valuable, and I'll try to remain focused and to the point. So, without further poo-poo, let's get into sh Watercolor is a medium full of wonders, from delicate transparency to unexpected granulation to complex pigment combinations. I probably have a dozen or so favorite watercolor colors, but this one was love at first sight. It has remained at the top of my faves ever since my first tube of quinacridone gold from the Windsor & Newton professional watercolor line. Two or three years ago, I dedicated a video to that specific tube, and I've since learned a bit more about watercolors, such as how quinacridones are pigments known for exceptional transparency and vibrancy, but also I've added to my QG collection. Hey, it's hard enough to say quinacridone without having to repeat it 20 times, here I've swatched all of my QGs so you can see their glories for yourself. And although they each have various pigment combinations, there is one pigment that is common to all these, and that is PY150, which is chemically known as nickel azo yellow. Now, there may be some confusion as to how these qualify as quinacridone colors, and they don't really. There was once a single pigment called quinacridone gold, and that was PO49. Production of that pigment was discontinued in the early 2000s, so what we have now are not authentic QGs, but rather hues. I wasn't into pigments back then, when some people apparently stockpiled tubes of OG QG before they ran out. So this is all secondhand info I can only hope is accurate, but I can definitely say that I love this color. And looking at all four of these swatches, one thing pops out. That's how similar they look. M. Grams may be the smoothest, Da Vinci's might be the deepest, while Schmincke has international cachet. But I'll always have a special soft spot for Windsor & Newton's quinacridone gold. They were my first, after all. I did a lot of research before choosing which brand to go with for my first gouache steps. Well, I watched a lot of YouTube videos, but the one that influenced me the most was from The Mind of Watercolor. Steve Mitchell ranked his favorite gouache brands, and Holbein was his number two. Why didn't I pick number one? Because it was Schmincke. And while I'm all for building a Schmincke collection in both gouache and watercolor, my coin purse says... Nein, nicht genug Geld. That said, Holbein isn't exactly cheap, but producer Mike found a good deal on this set of 12 5 milliliter tubes. There are other sets available, as well as individual tubes, in this 5 mil size, but also in 15 mils. If you have any interest in Holbein's Iridori sets, the four boxed sets themed to each season, then check out Becky Tregear's videos covering those. She featured each of the Iridori sets on their own, and then combined them into one big set. She's enthusiastic and gives great swatch. So follow the links in the description. To say that I've taken a shine to this matte medium is an understatement. I've now completed four or five pieces with this set, and I keep thinking, what can I do next with gouache? 
I'm not saying I've kicked watercolors to the curb. I actually enjoy using both on the same projects. But you know that meme of the guy checking out an attractive gal while his girlfriend looks aghast? Yeah, that. A number of viewers were very helpful with advice and tips, so I made sure to get some more white, as one person suggested. And sure enough, it was needed, because I went through that little tube of white pretty darn quick. So, do you think 60 mils will be enough? One day, producer Mike excitedly burst into the studio, saying, I've got something for you. Well, I was all aflutter until he plopped this down on my desk, a Pen Plus Gear sketchbook. The letdown was real, but one of my things is going with the flow, so I examined the item, figured out its features, and then put it to use as my desk sketchbook. As far as I can tell, the Pen Plus Gear brand is a budget line of office supplies available at, and exclusive to, Walmart. This item is like $2 and has what seems to be basic sketch paper. The dimensions are 5.5 by 8.5 inches. So why is this one of my favorite art things? Well. In photography, there's a saying, the best camera is the one that's with you. And with producer Mike being a former professional photographer, I can tell you that I am so tired of hearing that saying. But there is some truth in it, because I keep this sketchbook at my computer desk, where I spend a lot of time. Its size means it can sit on either side of my keyboard. Its wire binding means it's not awkward to handle and it lays flat. Its cheapness means I don't hesitate to use it for any and all ideas, even the sucky ones. Although, yeah, no, I'm not showing the sucky ones. I've yet to choose a drawing to slip into the cover, but I've already put a hefty dent into this sketchbook. And I should probably add a sticky note to the dozen or so already lining the edge of my monitor. Oh, one that says, buy another Pen Plus Gear sketch diary. There are certain tools and supplies that I use so much that I sometimes sound like a broken record when mentioning them. This is one of those. It's the Lily Shade from Roar and Cleaner's Sketch Ink line. Brown with a hint of green, it looks like muddy puddle water, and I love it. These sketch inks are formulated for fountain pens, and even though there is visible settling in the jar, I just give it a good shake and use away. I've yet to have any fountain pen issues with it, possibly because it doesn't sit inactive for long but I still recommend regular pen maintenance and cleaning if using it that way. Since it's waterproof, I can line and wash without worries. Sure, I can use other inks with watercolors as long as I wash then line, but hey, gonna be real here, the less thinking I have to do, the better. These days, only so much information sticks. I mean... I can't even tell you how old I am without referring to an online age calculator. And if you're sitting there thinking, oh boy, that is one ugly color. Well, you're entitled to your opinion, of course, but there are other colors available, such as the neutral black of Lottie, the dusty blue of Frida, and the mauvey pink of Jewel. What is this interesting pen I just used to demonstrate Lily? Why, it's the Yongsheng Brush Fountain Pen, another of my favorite art things. It's available in a pack of three for about $16. That breaks down to five thirty-three per pen. On the Amazon listing, they claim the line width you can get ranges from fine to broad. I think it's more accurate to say medium to broad uh, and beyond. So if you need a fine line, this isn't the pen for you.
If, however, you want a not-so-fine lining experience with a flexible brush tip, then this will likely be your kind of pen. The cap is a secure screw-on type. The reservoir holds a generous amount of ink, which is good since if you're a broad stroker, you'll lay down a lot of ink quickly. It has a built-in piston mechanism. Uh, to fill with ink, just dip the brush tip into your ink bottle and turn the knob at the end. I love using it for quick and loose sketching and for adding bold ink work to finished pieces. And what about the paper I've been writing on? Well, it's the reverse book from Rhodia. A video containing my initial testing of this notebook will be posted in the near future. I'd been meaning to try some more types of fountain pen friendly papers. So when we recently visited the Artist and Craftsman Supply in Tacoma, I was engrossed with their spinning tower of Rhodia. That makes it sound like a thrill ride. It was just a display rack with all sorts of Rhodia products. This one has 80 sheets of 80G weight paper and is 8.3 by 8.3 inches. It has a dot grid and is wire bound. I chose this notebook because I like the square shape and the dimensions. The front and back covers are flexible, so not much support there, but since I'm using it on my desktop, I don't see that as a detriment. The dot grid is great because I find it noticeable enough to guide my writing, but not so noticeable to be distracting. After experimenting on several sheets, this is currently my favorite notebook for fountain pens. In fact, I even plan on using it for some future correspondence. It's been nearly a year since acquiring my first fountain pen. I've since built a very modest collection, and the one I use most is the Lamy Safari. I find it both attractive and reliable. It is German-made with ABS plastic for the body and snap-on cap. The little cutout serves as an ink viewing window. Other standout design elements are the bent metal clip, the flat angles on the grip for finger placement, and the Lamy name in a bold font on the barrel. Mine has a fine nib, but there are other nib size options. As for performance, I have zero complaints. The lines are smooth, and the feedback is pleasant. I love that it provides an enjoyable, no-fuss writing experience. Well, no fuss as far as fountain pens go. There is always a certain amount of maintenance, and these things don't refill themselves. But aren't those rituals part of the charm? But when I want to really impress someone, I whip out this guy the Twisby Vac 700R. It's a clear demonstrator style, and since this is the limited iris edition, it has an anodized titanium finish. It's the fanciest and the priciest pen I own, and I love to use it. Significantly heftier than the Lamy Safari, it feels substantial in my hand and it has a vacuum filling system that eliminates the need for cartridges or converters. It's slightly finicky as I've experienced skips and hard starts on some types of paper, but with proper paper pairing, it writes like a dream. It has a beautiful nib, in this case a fine. I like to keep it filled with a purple ink, that way, when I'm writing with it, I can pretend to be the Purple Princess of Penalia, signing the latest imperious decree. Oh, the peons love it. It was just a few months ago that I discovered blue shop towels. Well, I'd heard of them, yeah, but never considered using them in the studio. Once I got my hands on them and felt how soft, flexible, and lightweight they are, I was hooked. 
finding out that they are durable as well was the cherry on top. That's right, I can use one, wash it, wring it out, and reuse it a couple of times even before it starts to fall apart, making it way superior to regular kitchen paper towels. It can be easily folded into small squares, so it doesn't take up much space on my art table. That makes it better than the old bulky rags I was using previously. While researching, I didn't find any definitive info on what these are made of, so I am unaware of any possibly problematic materials. The current Walmart price for six 55-sheet rolls is seven fifty. dollars uh, Wow, is that right? That seems really low. In any case, I much prefer these to rags, paper towels, and facial tissues. In fact, it might even be my favorite art thing of 2022. Well, that turned out more leisurely than intended. So now that my tea is completely cold, let's wrap it up already. All that leftover Halloween candy isn't going to eat itself. Plus, Thanksgiving is in, like, two days. I need to mentally prepare myself for... Ugh, socializing. I'm happy to share my favorite art things of 2022. Maybe you got some ideas. Maybe you got annoyed. Maybe you're thinking, she could have condensed this to five minutes and saved us precious baking time. Now I'm going to Grandma's house with a soggy bottom. To which I have an answer. Blue shop towels. You're welcome. No, I mean, thank you for spending a few minutes here at Inkworks. Until next time, have a very happy Thanksgiving. And stay artsy, my friends.